Hey, Michael. Are you ready for Karen. part three? Yeah. So we're going to do part three of radical orthodoxy, and um, I'm having a little hard time understanding it, so I'm going to read part three, and then maybe you can walk me through it. To this traditional understanding, it adds a specifically more modern view that the realm of culture, language, history, and our technological interactions with nature also belongs to this participatory ascent. The realm created by human beings is not incidental to the truth, nor is it a barrier against it. Human poesis participates in the divine verbum, the son of God. Likewise, human social exchanges participate in the divine donum, the Holy Spirit. Through both these processes, nature also comes more fully to herself. So I guess we maybe should define some of these Latin terms. Um, yeah. Uh, verbum is essentially, it's the Latin version of logos, right? It's mm -hmm. the word. Okay. Um, and then donum is just, it's a Latin version of the, the Holy Spirit. Now, I know that the root of that is, is to give. Yeah, I was going to say it's like gift, isn't it? That's what yeah, I... So, I yeah, so I, I assume the noun version would be a gift. Um, so... Um, oh, that's where we get donate. Cool. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> so, yeah, I'm, I'm assuming there it's, um, you know, it's talking about the fact that, you know, when Jesus goes away, he talks about waiting for this, you know, gift from the Father. Um, and that poesis, is that the same one that's like poema in... in uh, where it means like workmanship or creation, creation, creativity. Yeah. It's the same thing where we get poetry and all these things. It's, it's, uh, it's making. Uh -huh. Cool. Okay. So let's go back to the first sentence then to this traditional understanding it, which I assume means radical orthodoxy as mm -hmm. a specifically more modern view that the realm of culture, language, history, and our technological interactions with nature also belongs to this participatory ascent. So what, what is he trying to say there in that sentence? Well, I don't know if you remember from my, converse, my first conversation or the, the interview I did with Dr. Michael Tafusha, mm -hmm. I, when I talked about, one of the questions I asked him was, is, is technology morally neutral or does it have a certain kind of metaphysical bent towards, towards evil or towards um, something bad, right? You know, like you, for instance, in the Bible, you have the, in the evidence of uh, like the tower of Babel um, and this sort of, and, and, and so Barfield kind of has a sort of, he doesn't ever specifically say, technology is bad but he he definitely is a prophet that's warning about how how bad things can get whereas i would say this is saying something to the contrary in a certain sense that that again it's saying specifically all all the making all the doing that we have is part of this participatory participatory ascent um and, and again, ascent is is referencing progress, right? A sort of movement um, back towards 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 God, and and so that that these things, rather than being a barrier against knowledge of God, are actually part of the way in which we we will come to know God. Now, it's interesting to think about this because I mean it just even with that language of ascent, right? There's a, there's a sense in which there's, there's a reality that we have not yet achieved, obviously. Right. And, and we had all, none of this would make sense without that. There's a, there's a already, but not here yet kind of thing, which I think we all would recognize is, is fully, um, fully realized within within the union between heaven and earth, which is down the road. Um, 
but yeah, I, I do. I definitely find this interesting because you know, I've I, in in spending a lot of time with Barfield, you you tend to as in in. Um, Dr. Fuchsia mentioned this as well, that you, you tend to come with a very negative view of technology overall. You kind of have a very dim view of where we're at in the 24th century and what all this stuff means. You know, like what what is, are we, are we gonna necessarily destroy ourselves with all this stuff that we've built? Um, and that that's kind of the feeling you get from Barfield. And, um, you know, he mentioned that when he was reading his, uh, his book, which was, which is essentially his PhD thesis to uh, one of his readers was Catherine Pickstock. And she was like, Oh, you, you've been, you've been spending too much time with Barfield is what she, she was saying, you know? And of course, so that there's, there's an, I find this interesting because it's an, it's another perspective on this issue that, that um, all is not lost here. Right. I mean, that, that's how I read this primarily that this, this, that, because again, you know, here's the problem, you know, like a, a lot of, a lot of what this whole, this whole um, text about, you know, in the, in the first two, it's about removing certain dichotomies. Right. And so even if we accept the first two, I'll, I'm just going to read the first two again. So the first one was denies a sharp distinction between reason and faith or reason and revelation. And then, and then the number two is the world can only be fully understood as participation in divine being, truth, and good in unity. So it's, it's, it's getting rid of that dichotomy between this sort of human material world and the world of God and, and, and our, our concepts of what is good. And now this is a, as a sort of, it's trying to get rid of a further dichotomy we could make, which is that, okay, yeah, all this natural stuff's good, but what about the stuff we've made? that's all crap. Right. And it's saying, no, actually that can be, can be pulled into this story as well. Well, that's interesting because the making, we tend to think that the making comes all from ourselves, but culture, language, history, technological interactions with nature, all of those things, we would be, um, wholly, completely colonized by what God already built into us mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in, in the making of that. Um, I think especially, well, if you listen to Jordan Peterson when he talks about the making of culture, so much of that is dependent on just who we are as people affects right. so much about the way culture gets created around us and language i mean because i believe that god is the one who created language in the first place obviously language has been even, even if you didn't assume that then language has still been greatly affected by how we perceive the world so all of those things are greatly affected by our personhood our consciousness and everything else so it's not um it's not holy. It can't be wholly separate from God. It has yeah. to be infused with God's divinity, God's power, God's influence on us, all of that. And, 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 um, and we recognize that too, right? Because I mean, like, like someone that's a great artist, never, they always, it's always historically been a thing that people talk about their muse. They, they, there's a sense in which they're communing with some larger reality that's kind of guiding them and that they, part of the work of um, of being an artist is to is to remove the barriers to that sort of communion so that you can you can let something larger work through you which which everybody uses that language or it has the this sort of felt experience of that happening yeah and and I and I I would like to add a couple of things here that struck me when you were reading it the second time. And that is that it part of our problem as people of <clears throat> wanting to attribute disaster to all these things is that we have this, I think it's a fairly common problem of wanting to believe conspiracy theories. 
there's something almost comforting about attributing everything to having a disastrous end. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we kind of easily fall into buying whatever conspiracy theory is being flung around, which is, I think, how we ended up becoming so polarized, where we have these two extreme points of view, both of which are disaster oriented in one direction or the other, and based on our willingness to believe conspiracy theories. Yeah, well, I think, I think the phenomenon of the conspiracy theory, there's a lot of things going on there. Um, one of them obviously is the breakdown in the trust of certain hierarchical institutions that we relied upon historically to make sense of the world. Um, they kind of break things down and give us a sort of narrative that we always, I mean, I don't think anybody ever had the uh, illusion that, you know, what the New York times printed 30, 40 years ago was the truth, but there was a certain uh, semblance of the truth, let's say that we expected. And, and that sort of trust has gone away. So that that's one big thing. But I think even more broadly speaking, what drives the reliance on a sort of conspiracy narrative is our desire for efficiency, which, which is related to, but it's not the same thing as what we do, we're doing in science, right? Because I think, because there's two aspects to science, right? There's the, there's the sense in which I want to know, right? I want to know, I want to, and, and, and that part of science, I think is ultimately always good because it's always expanding. It's always like, you know, those rounding errors I was talking about when we were talking earlier, like you always want to get beneath them. Like you always want to go further. You don't, it's never quite, it's never really good enough. It's good enough to write this paper now, but if you're a real scientist, you want to know where all these aporias, where all these contradictions, where how you can go and, and dig into them and know more. Um, but then there's the other side of things, which is control oriented, right? Which is like, I want, I don't really care about how this thing works. I want to know what buttons I can push on it that model that reality well enough that I can control. And I think these conspiracy narratives come out of that, right? I want to have a sense of, of, of understanding of this very complex phenomena that I, I'm, I'm actually too lazy to go and figure out for my own. Um, and, uh, you know, that, 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 I'm actually not going to go do the work. I'm going to take this kind of uh, preformed cookie cutter narrative and that will stand in the place of real exploration and understanding. And it fits well enough. It fit, it, it's, it's a good story. So good enough. Well, yeah, that takes us back to what we were talking about earlier with Robert Jensen's um, article about story and promise and the, the frame of the story that we've always or that we brought with us into modernism, the idea that, that stories have a, you know, a narrative arc and that they have a, a potential for a good ending. And we have certain things that we believe about stories and we, we tend to believe the same thing about our lives. And so it, that's why we have all these YouTube mavens who are always talking about, you know, was it like stories of old or, or Jonathan Peugeot talking about, you know, stories and all of that, because we have a general idea of what a story should look like and that postmodernism has kind of thrown that out the window. But I want to tie that into the second thing I was going to say beyond conspiracy theory, because I think you're correct about the issue of control. Well, two th I, I, I want to talk about context and I also want to talk about what you said earlier about um, the technological interactions with nature, do they have only a potential for evil or do they also have a potential for good? And how, how, would, we, how would we work that out for ourselves? I was saying that we have a tendency to want to believe that it's all gonna end up badly. We're, you know, we're gonna end up with cyborgs and we're going to end up with um terminators you just saw the other day that some was it a sports team or somebody just bought some of those mechanical dogs those robotic dogs <laughs> oh 
Oh no, some police force actually bought some of those robotic dogs to use in their in their police force. I mean, it's just terrifying when you think about it because they look exactly like the cyborgs before the Terminator, you know, before the human Terminator show up. Hmm. Um, they actually use them. Interesting. I'm, I'm, or they, they're well, proposing. This may have been a conspiracy theory. I don't oh, okay. know. Oh, I only okay. saw the headline. I didn't go to the article, you know. But you've seen the Boston Dynamics dogs, right? Boston yeah. Dynamics makes these robotic dogs. Yeah, that yeah. Are very powerful and can do all sorts of stuff that you kind of wish they couldn't do. But anyway, so so the there's the control issue. There is the what would it take to convince us what what would we have to change in our world for these things to turn out for good instead of evil or is there the potential for good whether we change anything or not you know so that's one question the other question is um when we think about the participatory ascent i think there's an issue of context related there because when we is he using participatory there in the sense that barfield would use it mm -hmm. that it, it's in our participating with god that the world comes into focus in a different way and that allows us to move towards him rather than you know remain our own gods would that be what he's talking about there Yes, it, it's also again trying to break down that that sort of uh, divide between the created order and the creator. In that, um, in between us specifically, that we are in some sense participating with God, in in terms of how again God is is writing a large story, but in a certain sense we are, our fingerprints are all over it as well as we have we are real characters with real agency that are writing our little bit of the story and affecting exactly how the masterpiece looks in the end. Now we, we don't, we obviously have that agency's incredibly limited um, within the little frame we've been given, but we're everything we're doing is in participation. And, and again, this, from my perspective, what, what this draws out is it's, it's a condemnation of the, the, the deistic version of a God who who creates this sort of uh, intricate, you know, uh, the clockmaker's universe. He creates this in, intri intricate mechanism of all these little things that do their things. And he kind of sets it up, winds it up and lets it go. And, you know, now it's on its own. It's, it's, a, it's a condemnation of that, which, which I think will become more and more important because you see, you know, you were talking about earlier about how, um, I don't know if this is when we were recording or not, but about how you have like, you know, the Lex Friedman and, and the, the types of guys he interviews, they're rationalists, but more and more you're talking to people that are seeing consciousness down at the, the sort of, uh, particle layer of reality of like this. Sort of, it, it, we're, and, you know, Paul lately has been talking about how modernity is coming to an end. That's one thing we're seeing right now. Modernity is finally falling apart. The story it tells isn't holding together. And, and, and the work post-modernity is done in sort of, you know, hollowing out its corpse is, is really reached a sort of tipping point in the, in the broader culture. Because I think these things moved first through, uh, you know, the, the academic circles and in the, uh, the universities. Um, and now it's, it's broken out now into the wider world. Um, and with that, so modernity is falling apart. It's story is coming to an end. And so we're going to have to come up with a, a better story. And, and, you know, some of it was another version of the story that people are coming up with is that we're in some sort of simulation, which, which ultimately when you think about it is that it's, it's a return to that deistic God, right? We have some overlords out there. <laughs> they set this thing up and now, you know, you know, they may have a million of these simulations going and, you know, we're just one of them. And maybe in some sense, we are, we are, we are the ones that created the simulation, you know, <laughs> because, you know, we, we are the product of some like long, long process of evolution that now gained the super, 
superior powers to create these emulations. And what they wanted to do was emulate their own history. And now that's what we're in. And, you know, you have people like Elon Musk, who's a very intelligent person, but he seems to think it's highly likely, you know, almost beyond a shadow of doubt that we are living in a simulation. But Which I find so peculiar because, I mean, on the one hand, it's a very physicalist view, right? That, that everything comes down to computation and that, that you can build a system like that and that, it, that we could be a simulation. But on the other hand, it's not, it, it also demands a God number two, an agent that participates. Because any of the, the simulation hypotheses that I hear about, they didn't just set the thing in motion and let it go. Every once in a while, they're observing what's happening and they tweak it a little bit. You know? Well, it's so the same, yeah. Adding the, you, some you, agency in there. Yeah, well, you, yeah. And, and, and are they are we just an experiment to see what happens? You know, like, let's see, we're going to invent the perfect society, but to do that, we're going to have to run a billion simulations. And in some of these simulations, everybody ends very badly <laughs> or most of them. Right. And then we get the one where they, there's some sort of success. I mean, see, I and, think none of those take into account this whole idea of context because as we were talking about earlier before we turned the recording on, every part of our lives depends so much on the context that we're in. Like you and I right now are in, in our personal lives, we're in a sort of tumultuous context that's going on in our lives. And maybe six months before that, we were not in a tumultuous context. And, and you can clearly see how differently your life plays out when you're in the midst of a tumultuous context. And you can see to what extent you are challenged in terms of developing character and, and maintaining a, a certain outlook of gratitude and humility when you're in the midst of difficult circumstances and uh, how a person gets changed and formed by the context in which they find themselves. And that context has to be important at every level of this. So it, it, the, the realm of culture, language, history, and technological interactions with nature. If you look at um, civilization broadly and look at how culture and language and history and technological interactions have been affected by the shifting contexts that surrounded those big moods, um, for example, if you look at um, how the Reformation arose, it came out of a particular historical context. Um, there are whole historical movements that have come out of a, a change in language or languages mm -hmm. have shifted enormously because of a particular historical context or a change in culture. These things all interact and they all depend on the context in which they find themselves. So I really think that these big principles that you can see like context come all the way down through all the layers and it, that con if that context is that important at the civilizational level it's also important at our personal level it's also important at the the different physical layers of reality so there's something very big there about context and about constraint um, and about being willing to observe reality without um, this preconception that people make that that it's it's only a neutral observation if you don't adopt any idea about a god who might be involved then it's not neutral anymore because you've already set up a preconception, right? I mean, yeah. don't you have to be open to all possibilities when you make an observation? Well, I th it, yeah, definitely. And I think in terms of the people that want to play the, 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 um, the neutral third party perspective, they, I, I think they're, <sighs> there's value in having that as a certain ideal 
within a certain specific frame, um, which is, is this sort of, um, but again, but the, the problem again is that that frame doesn't, it's not, it's not the whole frame and, and, and everything else has to be layered into that as you were pointing at, pointing out. And so, um, this, this is the real problem nowadays and is because part of, part of why hierarchies exist, right. Is to deal with that, that frame problem, right? Like if you're at this level of the hierarchy, you're dealing with this level of the frame. If you're down here, you're dealing with this level. And, um, we don't have that sort of organization in terms of society, in terms of, uh, all these different things. We we've, we've kind of, there's been this movement to flatten out hierarchies and now we, 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 you, you just see this all the time where somebody's applying a principle that is a principle that works well within its own little space, but they're applying it to something that's not applicable. And you see this even in the sciences all the time, you know, like I'll, I spend a lot of time on, um, you know, this, uh, hacker news website, which is like, it's basically, you know, everybody talking, getting in the weeds on, on these tech things. Right. And it's so often the case that somebody is just wrong because they're and somebody else in the comment third will, will replace them. Like, Oh, you're, you're, you've, t you've transposed something from this frame over into this frame. And that's, we're, we're kind of doing that all the time because of, again, all these, these hierarchical structures, which have been decried as evil are being broke down such that, we don't have the filtering that they do to us that allows us to, uh, to, to look at a sort of frame and, and get good at what's, what we manage within that. We're, we're trying to do it all. Um, and, I think, uh, I think memes are training us to do that too. To what? To, um, to misapply a principle in oh, yeah, yeah. another area because, because memes are, pretend to be like generally true about everything and you can kind of feel it when you look at the meme like yeah you know you can get snarky about it and oh isn't that so cool and your brain wants to apply that to everything then because it simplifies life if you can mm -hmm. apply that same meme to everything you don't have to think anymore right yeah this is uh yeah this wasn't explicitly what we were talking about but there was a, a one of those sarah coakley videos that i was watching recently um and we talked about her interaction with uh the guy from closer to the truth but i i find her really fascinating because she is what's known as an analytic theologian which is like this new discipline of of in sense trying to bring a, a trying to bring a greater degree of um, precision to the language we use to, to talk about theology with. And there was a really good interview with her with that. Um, actually, I think, I think it's in one of her videos with close to the truth. She talks about this um, and about the ways in which, um, you know, th there's, there's, a, there's two problems you can go into here, obviously, because you can, when you start trying to get precise with your language about theological, there's this huge problem of what, what can you actually be precise about, right? Like what can you actually, like, especially when you get into these areas of mystery, like she brings up specifically the, the incarnation, like there's a lot of, and, and, and her point is that you, you have to have these sort of mystery cards that you play, but you can't play them too soon. So it's like this sense in which, um, this discipline is about trying to push the edges of what we can say things about. And she is, she holds to the notion of she wants to be very careful about making sure we don't go too far, right? That we don't, we don't try and get precise. We don't try and get all precise in an area where we're talking nonsense because it's, it's above our pay grade, so to speak. It's just outside of what we have given, been given access to. So mm -hmm. to talk about it is just speculation and that we should kind of leave that to the, to the side. Um, and that to me, what, what she's doing is really interesting because you can see in her interaction where they're talking about 
rationality, if you ever take it to its end, it always, it always deconstructs itself. That's what we've learned in the postmodern frame. Um, it, it, if it, if it, it, it doesn't work out as a, as a whole way of life, it is, has to be nested in these other things, these a priori assumptions, these a priori structures about value, um, and what is better. And, and that, that, that can't be supplied by rationality itself. It, those are inputs into it. Um, and so I'm, I'm kind of losing the thread of where I wanted to go with this, but um, there was, there was some, there was some tie back into what you were just making reference to um, about. Well, you were talking about the, you were talking about the Hacker News article where people- Oh, the frames, yeah. From one frame to another frame, right? They take the yeah. same principle and try to apply it in two frames that are too disparate to be applying the same principle. Yeah, and ultimately when you think about it, you know, religion itself is no different because religion is its own sort of meme. It is, it, it is a, it's a way of condensing the, the highest level representations of reality into, into modes of communication that, that can be reliably transmitted to each other, both in a social context, but then historically through time. And, um, and so there's, there's that balancing act of saying, okay, this has to be as accurate as it can be, but at the same time with the recognition that the, the compression to make it small enough, to make it transmissible enough is necessarily going to, to, to play havoc with that accuracy. And so, um, and so how do you, how do you hold to the truth of something while also, holding to the fact that um, the, the sort of symbols, the sort of handles you use to reference those things aren't the things themselves, that they're, they're, um, they're tools of the trade and they, those tools of the trade need to be constantly evolving. You have to be kind of working to update them to make sure that uh, they're actually pointing to what you hope they are. Uh, the problem is we, we all have a tendency towards decadence which is we just, we want the benefits of the thing without having to do the work of uh, updating it to our current context, to our current frame. And so that's, um, that's why I think, I think you see this sort of problem of, of things being so misapplied. Well, I, I think you, you probably knowingly wandered into, um, the answer to one of the big questions that we have, not, not question, but one of the big problems that we face nowadays is that so much of the modern church has um, attempted to compress in order to make transmissible to the simplest common denominator to try to draw as many people in as possible. And they've compressed it to the point where they've lost all meaning. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of reminds me of when my daughter was in seventh grade, my older, when my older daughter was in seventh grade, so this would have been back in the 1980s, she brought home her science textbook. <laughs> it had been dumbed down to the point, and, and this was in a normal school, completely normal school. This was supposed to be regular science. Half the book was illustrations, and the other half of the book was this very, very simplified language, because I think especially, I don't know how it is now, but back then they were not teaching phonics to children to learn how to read. They were teaching them this whole word method. Mm -hmm. In order to teach the whole word method, you can only teach so many words each year because people can only memorize so many words visually and auditorially. And so they would teach 150 words one year and then the textbook, you'd have to have the same textbooks all the way through all the years so that you could keep building on the same banks of words. 
So by the time you get into seventh grade, you don't have that many good words to use. So they simplify the language down. And it was just so dumbed down that it, it, you can't make sense of things when the language is too simple. You know, yeah. I always well, I, I, I do why do you have to use such complicated language? Well, because certain words compress a great amount of information that you need mm -hmm. to have. And it, you might have to write 10 books in place of one book if you're using the right kind of language. Yeah. But our churches nowadays have simplified the message down to make it everybody happy and have all the pretty music and all that kind of stuff to bring people in. And they've lost the content, the real content in doing so. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's just so much to talk about there. Um, because the, the church, I, 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 I'm absolutely convinced that the church itself facilitated a lot of these movements and how we view truth um, and this sort of flattening of things. Um, and, and you could see it in the sense that which uh, and I, I think this is a good thing, but I think we, we've it's also a, a bad thing in that we've, we've flattened the Christian message such that the church is almost irrelevant in the story. Because, because again, like the, the church, you kind of have this direct access to God and, and like, you know, it, and, and there is, there is the place of the church as this sort of vehicle for the transmission of salvation is kind of goes away because you, well, I just have this unmediated straight access to God. Like, I, he's my best friend. He's, he's my, and, you know, um, you know, Paul talks about, he likes to talk about uh, Chuck Colson and how he, he was a Christian. He was an Episcopalian, but then he comes home one day after, you know, all this stuff. And he says, I'm, I've been born again. And all I think we've, we've talked about this before, but there's a, there's a sort of flattening down of all this to where like all these other things don't matter anymore and you can just go straight to God. And I think that there's something good there. There, there's something real there about God's desire to participate with us directly. But, but we've, we've kind of, I don't know, I don't know what you think about this, but like, it's, it's like, this is kind of blotted out these larger structures that are really crucial and important just as interpretive structures for what's happening when you have that mystical experience where you feel the closeness of God and, and, and helping you to understand what's going on and put that into a larger context for how you live a, a life. Um, we've, um, we've kind of destroyed those structures by making them superfluous to the, to, to the overall story. Well, I, I think one of the ways in which the structures are important you can think about it in terms of um, during the Middle Ages when literacy was very low, mm -hmm. the churches had artwork inside of them, you know, like the, the stations of the cross. And the artwork would show each station of the cross. So it would tell the story of the triumphal ride into Jerusalem ending with the crucifixion and the resurrection so that the, the story was there that could be told to the people through the artwork. And um, we, you know, and then I think it was Tyndall that um, first put the scriptures into English so that those who were in the English speaking world could begin to read the scriptures for themselves. If people are diligent and actually read the scriptures for themselves, involved in this personal relationship that they have with God to help them as they read the scriptures. Perhaps they could get all of this, you know, what they need, they could probably get. But what happens is that we're people. <laughs> so we don't take the time to invest in actually reading and um, letting the word incorporate into our lives, yeah. you know, let, letting the verbum yeah. Integrate but here's the thing, like, what, well, what about all the people before they could even read that? Or were they, were they, did they have, 
did they have real Christian faith? Did they have real Christian community well, before they had, that? They had the tradition, they had the teaching, they had the unity, they had the communion. They had, that, that's why I was saying the structures can take the, I don't know, take the place of, but can support that relationship in a way that just you and the word of God is going to rely a lot more on you spending time in the word. But if you can rely on the structure and you, you stay within the structure, you have your life group every week, you, you have this opportunity to worship God together with the body, you're participating in all of these things all the time, then it, it's kind of holding you in the frame. But right. if, you, if you pull yourself away and say, oh, I can, get, I can get by with just going out and having walks in the night sky and looking at the stars, and that's enough for me, you're going to fall away from the frame very fast. You know? I, think, I think this idea of, of the Bible as the replacement for church is a peculiarly American phenomenon. And we don't we don't realize how much we've been influenced by that. It's funny in one of those conversations with between Sarah Coakley and the Closer to Truth guy, mm -hmm. he says to her, he says something. Oh well, you know, Christianity is based on the Bible, and she 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 kind of like gives him that one too, which that's not actually true. Like, you know, nobody became a Christian because of the Bible. You know, no <laughs> the 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 church produced Christians, which produced one of the one of the side effects of that was the bible being produced mm -hmm. you know that was so it's like everything we've gotten everything backwards in the current frame like and and you know i think paul talked about this at one point you know in, in america one of the reasons the bible became such a thing was that you didn't have the institutions and all you had was this book and so that was kind of had to because we we there was such a rat, rapid expansion across a huge geography you'd have like these itinerant ministers that would come through and, and like the Bible kind of stood in the place of all the other things for, for such a long time here that it be kind of became the thing itself. Um, but I think we, we forget that the church is an important part about how that book should be interpreted and how it should be read. And we, um, I, I don't know. I think we've, it, 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 even this idea of salvation is something that comes through having the right propositional statements. That I don't think is, is biblical at all. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's, we've, we've kind of, it's, it's one of the reasons why we become, see like, for, for, you know, before we start recording too, like I, I could tell you had a lot of unease with, with this guy closer to truth because he's going around he's getting so close to the edge but doesn't want to go over this line propositionally i i think it's actually i don't i, I would like him to see him cover that line as well but i think i don't know i think there's something deeper than the propositions well, that Scott, we were acting when on. i was saying that i wasn't saying anything about the propositions so it's always interesting to me how, how my words get taken but well, I mean, he's also, but, but I, I think, I think he's acting him. out in a way very similar to Jordan Peterson. If, he's spending all these time talking to the theologians. He's acting as if there's some truth here that's worth exploring. Um, I think he's, he's playing a certain, he's has a certain mask on in this role of the closer to truth guy. Um, that he, he's not willing to take off that mask while he's playing that role. It's very similar to how Jordan Peterson is playing a role when he says, I'm not going to answer your question about this because, you know, I don't know what you mean by God. I don't know what you mean by this. I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going to bow down to this. Right. Um, and so I think this propositional layer has, uh, it's gotten so corrupted so that it's, um, It's uh, it's not it's not the place that I look anymore to see if somebody is aligned to truth any longer. Well, I I remember a, a women's retreat I was at probably twenty years ago, and there was a woman teaching, and I, I wish more people would listen to this idea because I think it's a really important idea. 
she was saying that in so many, so much of the evangelical church, and this was already 20 years ago, that they're so afraid of whatever they think the Holy Spirit might do in a worship service, that instead of worshiping the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Scriptures. Yeah. Because if that's your frame, then you don't have to, um, like, the church I was attending at the time was a perfect example of this because they had excellent expository teaching every Sunday. And I was usually involved on the worship team and they'd hand out this order of worship thing that tells you at what minute everything is going to happen during the hour. And then at the top, it always would have a little prayer, you know, let the Holy Spirit be in control of this service. <laughs> but, at, but at 902, we're going to have the invocation. And at 904, we're going to have the prayer. And at 907, yeah. we're going to have the offering. There was no room for the Holy Spirit to operate in that service at all. And yeah. And we would be singing songs about raise your hands, you know, and everybody would be sitting there like this. <laughs> Nobody would ever raise hands because that was scary. Because if you got physically involved in worship, who knows what might happen? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's the whole thing right there. Because in, in his thing here, he says the human poesis participates in the divine verboom the son of God participates in the logos that that is the word, but that's not just the Bible. It's also the son of God. Right. And likewise, human social exchanges participate in the divine donum, the Holy spirit. It's our communion together that participates in the gift of the Holy spirit. And, um, through both these processes, nature also comes more fully to herself. So he leaves the father out there. So I don't know where the father fits into that, but. Um, well, I think, I don't think he's out of it, but I think there's, there's something, there's something unique in, in the, uh, the church that is, that is unique to the son and the, and the spirit. Um, again, I don't think, I feel like a lot of work's gone into the Trinity that just kind of stopped at some point that, um, I'm really interested to dive more into Sarah Coakley's work. Cause I know some of, she's done some stuff on the Trinity. That's interesting. And, uh, as well as that uh, guy Jensen, um, his, uh, his work on that, because I, I, I think there's uh, a lot of people just haven't taken this stuff seriously enough. They've, they've just kind of accepted the strangeness and just moved along and become kind of obsessed with the current frame. And I, th I, j I just feel like um, there's something, I don't know. My, my intuition is there's something deep there that uh, to be explored. Well, so maybe for our next talk, we should take a little, a little detour in radical orthodoxy and take a look at Sarah Coakley. We mm -hmm. can look at a couple of her videos and take them yeah. Art and see what we can learn. That, that sounds like a good plan to me. Okay. Well, it's been great talking to you, Michael. Yeah, same here. Yeah. Good seeing you. Bye-bye. All right. Bye.